want to start out today um, showing you some personal pictures. They're not of me, but they're of something in my family. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of graves. Now, that's kind of weird, I know. But this first one, that is my Grandpa Miller's gravestone. His name was Sanford Paris Miller. My dad's name is Roger Paris Miller. My name is Richard Paris Miller. We gave our son the middle name of Paris as well. We thought for a long time that was a family name. Found out that it wasn't a family name at all. I don't know why they chose that. But my grandpa, I called him Pa, Pa Sanford. Um, he was wonderful. And I would um, go to his house, and my mom always made sure that I ate my vegetables. You know, I couldn't have ice cream until I ate my vegetables. But luckily for me, Pa did not make me eat my vegetables before I had ice cream. And it was wonderful. My grandpa was born in 1925, and he died in 1976. He only lived 50 years. This next picture is of my great-grandpa's grave. Uh, his name was Will Miller, and Will was born in 1900, and he died in 1973. And I can remember going to my grandpa Will's house, and uh, we would gather around, and, and I don't know if you have relatives like this, but my grandmother you could not go to her house if she, unless you ate something, okay? She would be offended if you didn't eat something. And I remember my grandpa, every time after he would eat, he would push back from the table and he would rub his belly. I'm not sure why he would do that, but he'd rub his belly. He'd go, oh, I believe that's the best I ever ate. And it didn't matter what it was. He loved to eat. And then the next picture I'm going to show you here was of my great great grandpa and his name was Philip Snyder Miller. He was born and this was cool. He was born exactly 100 years before I was born. He was born in 1864 and I was born in 1964. And uh, his name uh, I never met him, but his name Snyder, they called him Snide. Now how would you like to have that name? Oh, there goes Snide. He's a snide person. Maybe he was. I don't know. But then the oldest picture I've got to show you was from my great, great, great grandfather. And here's the, the tombstone. You can barely read it. But his name was Henry Miller. And he was born in 1827 and died in 1895. And he say, why on Resurrection Sunday would you show pictures of graves, really for one reason. Do you know what all these graves have in common? Our family owned them. They're on family farms, family grave plots, and the, the point was that our family had these grave sites because they were planning on being there for a while. We called that their final resting place. Now, we believe in the resurrection, and we believe that Jesus is coming again, but we got these grave sites because everybody in our family one day is going to be put to rest in that place, and we own them. And you say, well, that's cool. What does that have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, just this. Do you know the difference between the grave that Jesus had and the grave that my family has and your family has is this. Jesus didn't need his grave for very long. It was just a three-day lease. He didn't need it for long. He didn't own it. He just borrowed it. And he is alive today. And that's what we celebrate. And that is the difference between Christianity and every other major religion in the world. It's this, that all the founders of other religions, they lived and they died, but they're still in the grave. But Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, as God in human form, he lived a real life, he died, he was buried in a real grave, 
But thank God he didn't need the grave very long. He got up out of the grave and is alive today. Well, I want to talk to you really for just a few minutes today about three things about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you and I need to be aware of and that we need to celebrate on this Easter Sunday. I'm going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, just a few verses. And this is after Jesus was crucified. And we pick up in verse number 57. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate. If you're not really familiar with the story, Pilate was the one that sentenced Jesus to death. He was the Roman leader, the Roman ruler that sentenced Jesus to death. He said he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth. And he placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. I, I find that very intriguing. He left, and I'm sure he was planning on visiting again. In fact, he owned it. He buried Jesus there. He put Jesus' body in this grave, and he was pretty sure that when he came back, that his body would still be there. But of course, we know the story how that after three days, Jesus got up out of the grave. I want to show you three things about the death of Jesus that will help us in our relationship with God and our understanding of who he is and of how much Jesus loves you. Here's the first thing. Jesus' death was necessary. It was a necessary Death. You say, why do you say it was necessary? Because it was necessary for you and me to be able to be in right standing with God. We put a lot of emphasis on going to heaven when we die. But I'm afraid that a lot of Christians miss out on the truth that when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, eternal life begins now. Now, does that mean that your physical body um, is not going to die? No, it will. You'll be put in a grave. But because we believe in the resurrection and we believe that Jesus is coming again, you're only going to be there for a short time. And when Jesus comes again and your body is resurrected, you will be able to be with God, not just in your spirit, not just with your soul, but in a resurrected body forever. Now, Jesus' death was necessary. It was necessary for us to be made right with God. It was necessary for our forgiveness. It was necessary for our salvation. You see, we could not do it on our own. I know that most Americans believe that the way to go to heaven is by being good. Most people, when you ask them about their own morality, they give themselves pretty high marks. Oh, I'm a good person. Very few people ever want to admit that when they die, they would not go to heaven. Most people think, well, I'm going there. I, I'm a good person. But you must understand that the death of Jesus was necessary because it's not your goodness that takes you to heaven. It's your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough. You see, if the standard is perfection, and it is, the Bible says uh, that God... Uh, has this divine standard, and it is perfection, and we all fall short. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, if the standard is perfection, and you even sin once, do you fall short of perfection? Yeah, you do. Uh, you, say, you don't have to be as bad as Hitler uh, to fall short of perfection, but every one of us is born with a need. We need a Savior. Every mother in the room knows this, that you do not have to teach a child how to sin. Now, I realize that little children, if they die, they're going to go to heaven. We believe that. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, no mother in here has ever had selfish lessons. All right, kids, today we're going to learn how to be selfish. 
How many of you know that if you've got two kids and they're playing and one kid has 10 toys and the other kid only has one toy, the kid with the 10 toys, you know which toy they want? The one toy of the other kid, right? You don't have to teach selfishness. You don't have to teach children how to lie. We are born with a sin nature. And as a result, the death of Jesus is necessary for us. I want to read to you from Isaiah 53. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, Isaiah, uh, talking about, prophesying about the, the Savior, Jesus. It says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. You ever look the other way? Sometimes something is so awful that you have to look away. Sometimes you are so uninterested, you look the other way. Sometimes, because a person has offended you, you, look the, you won't even look at them. That's how we treated Jesus. We would not even look at him. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought that his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. And yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. You see, every one of us has gone our own way. Some more so than others. Some of you were raised in church. And uh, I'll say this, the only thing that will separate you from God more than your sin, you know what it is? It's your goodness. You see, for those who believe that their goodness is what makes them right with God, you are separated from God. The Bible is very clear in Luke chapter 15, it talks about the prodigal son. I talked about this this past Friday. And you know, the fact is, for all of us, we're like that prodigal. And yet, God, the Father, draws us, loves us, wants to be in relationship with us. Jesus' death was a necessary death. Even though we stray from God, even though we need a Savior, I want you to understand, He was rejected so that we could be accepted. You can never feel any rejection that Jesus has not already felt. He was despised so that we could be loved. It doesn't matter how unloved you feel or how unlovable you feel, Jesus already felt it. He already suffered it so that you could be loved by God. He was sorrowful so that we could have joy. There's never been any pain that you've experienced that Jesus does not already know about. He was punished so we could be forgiven. He took God's judgment so we could receive God's love. You see, there's a bit of a, a misunderstanding about God and his love. There are some people that just believe that God just kind of does a wink and a nod towards sin, that, you know, everybody, it doesn't really matter. It's called universalism, the idea that everybody eventually will go to heaven. Well, if that was the case, there would have been no need for Jesus to die for our sins. There would have been no need for God to pour out his wrath on his son. But because God is a just and holy God, he did not allow sin to go unpunished. But the good news is that he punished Jesus in our place. You say, well, that's not fair. Of course it's not fair. But it shows the grace of God. That's what grace is. We get what we do not deserve. I promise you, I did not deserve Jesus to die a death that I should have died. But in his grace, he gave it to me. In his mercy, he did not make me die on that cross. But the fact is, Jesus' death was necessary for me. God, in his love, poured out his punishment on Jesus, and literally Jesus suffered our punishment for sins. Now, you can reject it if you'd like. Um, people, I, I hear people say sometimes, well, God, you know, 
is he going to send people to hell? Well, no. The fact is, God doesn't send you to hell. You send you to hell. You see, in order to go to hell, you've got to crawl over the love of God, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus, the grace of God, the mercy of God. And if you want to do that, he'll let you. He's not going to force you. But the fact is, in his love, Jesus' death was necessary. He became stricken so that we could be healed. He became the way, the door, the light, the good shepherd. He died so that we could live, and he resurrected so that one day we could too. Jesus' death was necessary. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Jesus' death was extraordinary. It was a necessary death, but it was an extraordinary death. Now, I don't mean extraordinary in the suffering that he went through physically. No doubt it was an extraordinarily painful death. But did you know that there were a lot of people that were crucified in that day? Rome crucified many. Jesus was not unique in that he died of crucifixion. Make no mistake, the the death was physically painful as much as anything you can imagine. But that was not the greatest extent of the suffering of Jesus. The greatest extent of his suffering was that he became sin for us. He took our sin on himself and suffered the wrath and the punishment of God. That's why it records in the Gospels that Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father turned his back on the innocent son. It was an extraordinary death. It was extraordinary, not only in what he suffered, but it was extraordinary because he died for us. Listen to Romans 5. It says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. By the way, that us sinners, that includes you. I don't want to burst your bubble but you're not perfect. I I, I don't want to disillusion you at all, but nobody thinks you're perfect either, all right? The truth is, we all know we're not perfect. We all know that we have sinned, and therefore, if we have sinned, what does that make us? Sinners, right? And so, Christ died for us. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. I agree with that, right? I mean, I, I know many people that maybe they're good people, but you know what? I'm not going to die for them. But it says, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Extraordinary. The death of Jesus was necessary for our salvation. It was extraordinary in that God died for sinners. I want you to think about what Jesus did and how extraordinary it really was. Think about this. God in diapers. (laughs) You ever think about that? The creator of the universe being born and wearing diapers. Uh, The creator who spoke things into existence, he pretty much knew how to build stuff, wouldn't you agree? Allowing an earthly stepfather to teach him how to hold a hammer. What humility. The one who spoke the universe into existence being taught to speak. You see, when he was born, he wasn't like, you know, some people were like, well, Jesus, a little baby walking on water. His mama couldn't even get him in the bathtub. No. No. He was 100% God, but he was 100% human. He was just like any other baby. He had to be burped. He would poop. I, I know you probably don't really think about that, but that showed his humility. The creator of the universe being taught to speak. Can you imagine this? The designer of DNA being taught to read. Can you imagine that DNA, the most complex language in, in all of the earth, in all the universe. Uh, scientists are just scratching the surface of what they understand. 
and the one that created the DNA code being taught to read. Now learn your ABCs, Jesus. You see, it was extraordinary what he did. But the most extraordinary thing was God dying for man. Extraordinary. His death was necessary. It was extraordinary. But thank God, it was also just temporary. You see, it wasn't forever that Jesus died, but he got up out of the grave three days later. Matthew 28, 5 and 6, then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said. That is what we celebrate this Easter weekend. This amazing worldwide celebration of the life of Jesus Christ is celebrated by billions of people across the earth. Throughout time, throughout the last couple of thousand years, There have been literally billions of people that have received Christ and become followers of Jesus, and they have celebrated throughout the ages, just like the billions do this weekend. But I want you to understand something. It doesn't matter how many billions of people have celebrated the death of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't receive it, if you don't celebrate it, It doesn't make any difference to you. You see, the fact is, you can read the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever will believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. You can read that, but unless you understand that God loves you, it doesn't make a difference. You see, the fact is, you can believe that God loves others, but you need to come to grips with the fact That the God of the universe, the one that knows more about you than anyone else, the more that knows more about you than you know about you, he knows more about you than anyone else, and yet he loves you more than anyone else. God wants it to be personal in your life. I just quoted John 3, 16. A lot of times we'll quote that verse, but we fail to quote verse 17. And I like verse 17. He said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, once again, this is not teaching universalism, the idea that everybody's going to go to heaven because Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. Well, do you know why he didn't come to condemn us? Because we're already condemned. You read in John 3, it says that you're born that way. You don't have to worry about it because you're already in this separation from God. Like I said earlier, we're born with this sin nature. And so the reason that Jesus came was not to condemn you. We're already condemned. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to forgive you. Jesus came to put you in right standing with him. That's why he came. And that's why we celebrate this Easter weekend. Let me ask you this question. Will you be willing to join the life of Christ today? We talk a lot about heaven, and and rightly so. I've done lots of funerals in my life, and I always try to bring comfort to people to let them know that one day there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more disease, no more separation. And that's wonderful. But what about now? How are you living your life now? Have you joined in on the life of Christ now? You see, God wants you to be saved. That's what we call it. Salvation. Crossing the line of faith. Becoming a believer. Following Christ. Whatever terminology you want to use, what it means is that you have agreed and you've asked for God to save you, to, for you to have Jesus to lead your life. It'll make all the difference in the world. And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, it says this, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be. It is the one prayer that God always answers yes. Now, I wonder today if you would ask, 
You see, the word ask there, it, it shows us believing that he exists. And you know what? Even if you're not quite sure about the Bible or theology or any of that kind of stuff, you don't have to be. You just got to believe in Jesus. You got to believe that he exists. It's not hard to believe that he actually lived because that's proven in history. But believe that he's the son of God. Believe that he died for you. That's what you believe. And then you believe that if you ask by faith, he'll save you. You see, that word ask, it implies faith. That by faith, I'm asking Jesus to save me. And so today, maybe you've not done that. Or maybe you're not sure. There are a lot of people that are very unsure about their relationship with God. And I want you to understand that it, it comes down to faith. It comes down to trusting him. He said, what if I don't have enough faith? I used to struggle with that a little bit when I was a young kid. And then until somebody told me, well, you know, if you ask, God gives you the faith. You don't have to worry about it. It's asking. Ask and you will receive, the Bible says. Ask and he will forgive you. Ask and he will save you. And so today... Maybe for those of you online, you would like to receive Christ. Maybe those in the room today, you would like to receive Christ. Here's how you do it, okay? Once again, it's at who, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, what do I do? Well, in your heart, pray something like this. It doesn't have to be these exact words. But understand that God wants you to ask this question. He wants you to come to him. He loves you. And he, in fact, died so that you would ask this question. And here it is. Say something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And I believe he died for my sins. And that he resurrected from the grave. And right now, I'm asking you to save me. I'm calling on the name of the Lord and asking you to save me. Would you come into my life right now? I want you to understand, God didn't say ask to be a member of the church. Do I think you ought to be a part of a church? Absolutely. But that's not what puts you in right standing with God. He didn't say, he didn't say ask to help you keep the Ten Commandments. He didn't say ask to help me be a moral person. He said, ask for Jesus to save you. And if you will ask that, he will. So today, here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to dismiss those that are getting ready to be baptized. We're going to have several people get baptized. And uh, we, we, it's very exciting. So you guys go and go back toward this area right over here. If you are wanting to be baptized today, but you weren't planning on doing it, I've got some really, really good news for you. We've got clothes for you to change into. You can get baptized today. If you receive Christ, if you say, I want to follow Jesus, I want people to know it, I need to be baptized, get up right now, and you can go toward the back, and uh, you can get baptized. In fact, some of you are like, well, I don't want to do it in front of all these people. Um, I'll ask everybody to close their eyes, all right? Uh, seriously, when we pray, you can get up and go to the back if you'd like to get baptized, even though you were not planning on it today. I want us to pray together, and then I want to give you this spiritual survey, and uh, then we've got uh, a couple more songs that you're going to love. You don't want to miss it, and uh, so let's pray together. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us today. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you for how much you love us. And Lord, I pray that you just help every person that has followed Jesus today. Help every person that has asked you to save them, both online and in the room. God, help us to grow in our relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that you just bless the rest of this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. 
If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.